On today's episode, we are going over the latest space news, including a second launch tower for Starship in Florida, a new X-ray observatory, NASA's experiment with laser communication to space, and the latest from aerospace startup Rocket Lab. Let's get going. This is the Space Race. By now, we're probably all familiar with the SpaceX Starbase facility at Boca Chica, South Texas. This is the location where the company builds and tests their Starship prototypes, typically with explosive results. Though the biggest project at Starbase for the past few months has been the construction of a launch tower for orbital flights of the Starship and Super Heavy Booster, this is by far the craziest launch tower ever built, probably even the craziest ever designed. It's more like a giant robot than anything, and Elon calls it the Mechazilla. Now, Mechazilla is about to get a new sibling on the space coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida. SpaceX has begun construction of a Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A, this is a launch pad that SpaceX leased from NASA in 2014 for a 20 year stay. Pad 39A is a historic location for the aerospace industry. The facility was originally built for the massive Saturn V rockets that sent astronauts on Apollo missions to the moon. All crewed Apollo missions with the exception of Apollo 10 were launched from this pad. It also served as one of two launch pads for the space shuttle program. The Starship Super Heavy Booster, which Elon Musk hopes to launch by February 2022, will be the most powerful rocket that has lifted off since the Saturn V was retired in 1973. But unlike the old Saturn V, or any other rocket for that matter, the Super Heavy and Starship are designed to come back in for a landing at the same tower they launch from. At the final moment, the robot arms of the Mechazilla will grab the rocket stages out of the air and place them carefully back on the ground. Elon even let us know in a tweet that the Florida launch pad will have a better launch tower and improved ground systems compared to the facilities at Starbase. We haven't gotten any direct comment from NASA yet on how they feel about Starship landings on their property, but they did provide some details of the agreement with SpaceX as to what the company can and can't freely do at the facility. NASA told CNBC in a statement that SpaceX is, quote, within the rights of their lease agreement to make launch infrastructure improvements within the boundaries of the pad. Currently, SpaceX only has approval to build the launch pad and will need further authorization for launches and landings, NASA told CNBC, adding, that it's not providing funding for the pad. We know from an Elon Musk email that leaked from SpaceX earlier this month that the company is targeting a Starship launch frequency of once every two weeks by the end of 2022. So having two launch pads is going to be a great help with that, particularly when SpaceX expand the use of Starship beyond just test flights and deployments of their own Starlink satellites. Commercial service to external clients is going to be much easier from the Cape. My prediction would be that SpaceX continues to launch Starship exclusively from Starbase until they can achieve at least a couple of perfect landing maneuvers and then start moving the operation to 39A when they have a bit of a track record. Enough to give NASA the confidence that they won't wreck the place at least. From talking about SpaceX's biggest launch now to their smallest so far. On December 9th, a Falcon 9 lifted off from Kennedy with a single 325 kilogram probe on board, the XP Observatory. The XP, also known by its full name, Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, is a new X-ray telescope that will study the most powerful objects in the cosmos. The observatory has been designed to detect a certain characteristic of light known as polarization. And according to NASA, polarization is the characteristic of light that can reveal secrets about the light beam, its source, and the environment it has traveled through on its way through space, giving us clues about the hidden corners of our universe. The reason that this one little telescope needed a whole Falcon 9 rocket to get it into position 
has to do with the very particular orbit that XB needs to live in to do its job properly. Because this telescope is looking specifically for X-ray radiation, it needs to orbit in a location with very low baseline radiation. Low Earth orbit is mostly a very good place for that, thanks to the Earth's strong magnetic field, but with the exception of something called the South Atlantic Anomaly. This is a big zone over South America where the magnetic field is unusually weak, and that allows the Van Allen radiation belt to come down much closer to the Earth in that one spot. The ISS actually has to pass through this anomaly to some degree every day. It's not a huge deal because the exposure isn't enough to hurt people, but it is enough to interfere with the XP getting a good look at black holes and supernovas in distant galaxies. The only way to avoid the anomaly entirely is to orbit directly around the equator of the Earth. That would require just 0.2 degrees of launch inclination from the surface, but the best we can get from Florida is 28 degrees. So the only solution to the problem was to have the second stage of the Falcon 9 with the XB on board make a very hard left turn in orbit, while at the same time firing its engine at maximum throttle. It's like the space equivalent of drifting a hairpin turn in a car. Vin Diesel would be stoked, and we should probably get him for that mission next time. Anyways, now that the telescope is in orbit, it can start investigating some of the craziest events in the universe. This thing will be looking into the debris clouds of dead stars to understand the process a star undergoes before going supernova. With the XP, scientists will study the supernova remnants to map the polarization of light across it to understand how these explosions take place along with their evolution. The XP will also offer a detailed look at what happens around black holes in our own galaxy. NASA says that matter falling toward a black hole settles into a flat disk, which is extremely hot. This disk can then reflect the X-rays around it and make the light polarized before it heads towards the telescope. The telescope will also detail the structure and strength of magnetic fields around plasma jets that emerge from a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. It's all trippy stuff and definitely something to look forward to that's going to begin observation in January. Another really cool new launch from December was NASA's Laser Communications Relay Demonstration, or LCRD. This is a new technology that will facilitate a laser-based optical communications link between the Earth and space. NASA has been using pretty much the same radio-based communication system for their space vehicles and crew since the year 1958, which is obviously less than ideal. We really need a better way to transfer data back to the Earth, and the LCRD should be it. This will enable a hundred times more data transmission per second than radio by using a short wavelength laser. This will allow vehicles to send back larger files and even live stream HD video from space. The laser-based system also makes for much smaller and more efficient hardware, both in orbit and on the ground. Taking up less space and using much less power is crucial on a spaceship or probe, Plus, the ground-based laser receiver can be up to 44 times smaller than a radio antenna. This demonstration will be in the testing phase for a couple of years still, but if everything goes well, we can actually get high-definition live streams from Earth orbit and eventually from the moon and even deep space probe missions. Let's talk about Rocket Lab. This New Zealand-based aerospace startup are basically the only people besides SpaceX who are doing really exciting and innovative work with their rockets. They've already been having great success with their Electron rocket that has been putting small satellites into orbit this year, and by next year, Rocket Lab expects to start recovering and reusing the first stage of the Electron. It won't land like the Falcon 9, but the Electron is small enough that it can come down on a parachute and then get caught in mid-air by a helicopter. Rocket Lab already made one successful parachute descent with the rocket last month and are working out the logistics for the helicopter catch. Earlier in December, Rocket Lab showed off their new design for the Neutron, a larger ship that is purpose-built to be mostly reusable. 
The neutron is 40 meters tall with a 5 meter fairing diameter, and with the first stage fully reusable, the neutron can lift 8 metric tons to low Earth orbit, or 15 tons max if the first stage is expended. The vehicle itself weighs just 480 tons thanks to a carbon fiber composite body. Rocket Lab have designed their own engine for the Neutron called Archimedes. This is a methalox engine just like the Starship, so it burns liquid oxygen and liquid methane, and there are seven of them on the rocket's first stage and one on the second stage. The Neutron also has this really clever design where the fairings are fully reusable as well. On other rockets, the fairing covers just pop off and fall back down to Earth, where they splash into the ocean and sink. SpaceX spent a while trying to catch the Falcon 9 fairings with nets and drone ships, but it didn't work out. I mean, you're trying to catch a big chunk of metal literally falling from space with a net, so no surprise that turned out to be difficult. But the Neutron doesn't jettison the fairings with exploding bolts. It just opens them up like a flower or a face hugger egg from the movie Alien, and then closes them again before coming back down for a landing. And to top it all off, the Neutron comes back down to land on solid ground at the launch site. Then they can just reopen the fairings, install a new second stage, close it up, and fly again. It's ridiculously cool and just baffling that more companies aren't working on products like this. And Rocket Lab is doing it without much fanfare or hype, and their CEO, Peter Beck, isn't even a billionaire. Well, at least not yet. Sure, the Neutron isn't as powerful as the Falcon 9, but that doesn't really matter. It's still more than enough for tons of different satellite launch applications, and it's actually more reusable than the Falcon 9, so could eventually prove to be cheaper. Rocket Lab has already gotten one vehicle to orbit, which is more than can be said for Blue Origin, and there's no reason to think that Neutron won't be a success as well. This is definitely a company to keep an eye on. Let us know your thoughts on the latest space news. How did you like this video format? And should we include more content like this along with our deep dive videos into planets and spaceships? Please don't forget to leave an offering to the algorithm gods and give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. We've got two more videos up there on the screen that you'd probably enjoy as well. Subscribe to this channel if you're not already for more space content and ring the little bell so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching the video today and we will see you next time.